Welcome to Centre Church. We hope you enjoyed this message, recorded live from our Burgess Hill campus. Do you know, over the last few weeks, we've been working through a series. Anybody remember what the series is about? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, yes, it's called Unlocked, and it's about the power of the Holy Spirit. So we've had three sessions, so quick recap. Uh, first one was... Hannah. <laughs> okay, the first one was Hannah, and Hannah spoke about and being empowered by the Holy Spirit for service, for those decisions, and for, for those times. You know, and even you know, even when we're faced with perhaps uh, uh, our faith being completely challenged, and we're not sure, we still rely on God. Still rely on God. Hey, I don't know about you, but I've been in those places. I don't know if you have, but I've been in some of those places where do you know? I just don't know what the answers are. And really, that's your promise, God. But actually, are you doing it? But we still stand on God because he is who he is. Yes? Okay, good. Come on. Then we had Wish. And Wish spoke about... And that was actually the same week as we also had a guest speaker, if you remember. (laughs) Julian's dad. Who also came and, and sort of shared some things, which was great and really good to hear. And it was about really who the Holy Spirit is and, and the, how the Holy Spirit enables us and uh, uh, how else to, to the work, the, I summarised it as the personal work of the Holy Spirit. Would that be about right? Yeah, okay, good. And then last week was Alex, and Alex was talking about how the Holy Spirit, how he points us to Jesus. Holy Spirit is humble and he points us back to Jesus. He wants to bring him glory, just as we want to bring Jesus glory in with our lives. And it's the same there. So I want to take a little bit of step back from the, all of this, and, and I think it's, all of that is really, really good, and I'm just going to continue it on a little bit. And honestly, it's taken me... Oh, I've prepared this, and then I've prepared that, and then I've changed it to the other. But anyway, I'm going to go with what I've got today, and let's see how it flows. Because, do you know, we, believe it or not, are a Pentecostal church. Yeah? We're a Pentecostal church. When Ruth and I, I mentioned us coming here, First, when we first came here, which is a few years ago now, um, this church was actually known as Burgess Hill Pentecostal Church. Yeah? And then we changed the name to Mid-Sussex Christian Centre because people didn't think that Pentecostal was good these days because culturally people didn't get what it is. And now we're Centre Church, and that's great. But guys, let's not forget we are still a Pentecostal church. We're still part of the Assemblies of God here in Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We are believing that the Holy Spirit does move in our midst. We believe in the Holy Spirit, that he has an impact on our lives. And we really should be seeing more, I feel, should be seeing more of him at work in us, through us, around us, in our community, wherever we are. Is that pie in the sky? Is that something we can't imagine? Is that something that, you know, just me, oh, yes, I wish? Well, let's see. I'll come back to it in a second. I'm going to, obviously, the, the base scripture for today, the base scripture for any of this, and I think it's um, one we started with right at the beginning with Hannah as well, is Acts 2. Uh, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, all the believers, were together, the 120 of them together, in one accord, in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. There was an infusion of the Holy Spirit that came into that place. A mighty wind in amongst everybody that was believing there on that day. And it filled the sound, the rushing wind sound, filled the house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them, it says here, um, uh, flames of fire and one sat upon each of them. So they saw visible evidence of the Holy Spirit touching all of this 120. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, baptised in the Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the thing that then drew the many thousands, you know, there were thousands of people that became Christians that day, the thing that drew them to the apostles' teaching was the fact that they heard them speaking in tongues. Yes, they understood it in their own language, but it was the speaking in tongues that drew them to the apostles that day. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and he came upon them in such a way that it emboldened Peter to be able to speak out 
and also they received the gift of tongues. Yeah? Okay, good. We get that. So, is that something that was for 2,000 years ago? It doesn't happen today, and we don't see a move of the Spirit like that these days. Is that the, the truth of the situation? I think if we're honest with ourselves, and I, I know if I'm honest with myself, my day-to-day -day catches me up and stops me hearing the Holy Spirit and stops me operating in the things of the Spirit in the day-to-day -day because I do my normal daily things and things of life, and the stuff of life draws away from God. I don't know if that's true for you, but I find that's true for me at times. It's true for me to say that I don't always experience the Holy Spirit in the same way as I have here in this place at certain times. And others of us have been here for a while, will you know, we'll agree, we'll know that we have experienced an overwhelming sense of Holy Spirit in this place. A presence of his Spirit in this place. And it only takes one service, it only takes one moment to turn everything around and then for us to see weeks and weeks of Holy Spirit ministering to us. We've seen it. You know, a few of us have anyway. And we know it. I have known the time to be overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit so much. You remember the time of the Toronto blessing and how it came here and laughter broke out amongst us. And I remember an evening, Sunday evening service it carried on and carried on. They shut everything down. I was still on the floor laughing. They ended up, the elders ended up having to carry me out and carry me home. Literally, carry me home. Because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that came upon me. And that's not just me, that was others. There was others there. And that's an experience we can have with the Holy Spirit. I don't know, I don't know. Don't know if that scares you, don't know if that's something you fancy or if that you want. But that's the sort of revival power that we can know by the power of the Holy Spirit. We've known when, we, when we, Ruth and I first came into this place, uh, and, and for Lydia and maybe a few others will remember, there was always the two elders on the platform, and you'd preach from here, and the elders would sit behind, and there would be that sense, why? Well, because there would be a movement within the, the congregation, within all of us, and there'd be people who would speak in tongues and in interpretation, and there'd be a prophetic word. That was amongst us. Are we seeing that today, guys? And, you know, again, Bishop shared that with us the other day and challenged with it. I sat there and thought, do you know, no, that's true. And I'm not knocking any of us. We're all, you know, yeah, you see what I'm saying. I hope you see what I'm saying. I'm not being negative. I'm saying, come on, have we got a hunger for this again? Have we got a hunger for this again? We've seen prophecies here. We've seen healing here. We've seen people touched here. You know, why shouldn't it happen again? Yeah, why shouldn't we be in that revival mode? Again, we're a Pentecostal church. Let's be Pentecostal. Okay, but, but, but is that just for us and is it just for here or should it have an impact outside? No, it should have an impact outside as well. It should have an impact on our community, on those people around us. Again, is that pie in the sky? No, I've experienced it. You know, um, um, I, I've always been one to say, well, you know, these people who go chasing after the blessing go to Toronto because it's the Toronto blessing or go these different places. No, don't do that. That's not right because God can be everywhere. And he's the same. So I've always sort of fought against it. But, um, and, and Ruth really wanted to go for many years, really wanted to go to Bethel in Reading. And then I happened to be over there on a business trip and I got to go, where she didn't. And so, yeah, she hasn't let that fully drop. But anyway... Um, but I went there and I was part of some of uh, what was going on there and I attended one of their Heaven in Business conferences and you know, I was there three days, three days, and I received something like a dozen different prophetic words in those three days. Now, was that in church? No? No? It really wasn't. Some of them were in the main meetings, but it was by the people, the very first meeting, the very first main meeting we were in, at the end of the meeting, the person next to me had a prophetic word for me. Have you got a prophetic word ready for the next person next to you? I wonder, I wonder. God wants to speak to us. Some of them were during small group prayer times. We have small groups in our prayer times and everyone felt they had something to share. Maybe it was only little, but they all had a little encouragement for me from the Holy Spirit that they wanted to share. One of the things they do in Bethel, I think it's great, is that you can actually book a prophetic appointment. You can book an appointment where people will listen to God for you and speak into your life. You, you test it. It's not directional. You know, we have to take the prophecy on board and we have to test it and decide, is that God speaking to us or not? But 
five, ten minutes with two people who are speaking over your life, I tell you, it's really, really impactful. So that, that was three. But the two that I really want to tell you about today, the first one was on the very first night we went out to dinner in the Japanese restaurant. And as we were in the Japanese restaurant, I've got my little book here, some of these things written down. In the Japanese restaurant, the waitress, I paid the bill, and the waitress brought me the bill, and the, the bill itself has faded. But on the back of it is a prophetic word that she had for me in the restaurant. Yeah? Now, these, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. This stuff happens. This stuff happens. And this can happen here. This can happen here. And then the one that really blew me away was the next morning. So I've been there one day, going the next morning. The next morning, we're into, and the, the, it's not in church, it's in a, a big coffee shop where they've got a, a venue where they can speak and you can sit around tables. And as I walked in, um, into the entranceway where the main coffee shop was, one of the stewards, one of the ladies that was steward in the conference, um, and I've just realised nobody's put a time up for me. <laughs> so good. Oh, no, there is. That's, oh, yeah, shame. Oh, wow. Well. Um, um, and one of the stewards, so one of the ladies, steward in the conference, telling us where to go and so on. I mean, just, just an ordinary person, if you see what I mean. Nobody, nobody, none of the ministers, none of this, just an ordinary person. She came up to me and said, well, you sat there yesterday, and were you wearing such and such a jacket? Said, well, yes. Wondering what's coming, you know, maybe I'd left something behind or I'd done something wrong or something. And she said... Well, the Holy Spirit woke me up in the middle of the night, gave me a vision of you sitting there, and this is a word that I believe he's got for you. Can you imagine? I know that's the culture they have, but that comes because of the fact that they, each and every one, have been encouraged to experience what those first believers there in Acts 2 what we read about again in Acts 10, where the, because those were the Jewish believers, now in Acts 10 we've got the Gentile believers, that's you and me, receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and we see it again and again. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, for you and for me, the refreshing, the renewal of the Holy Spirit, the filling with the Holy Spirit on a day-by-day -day basis, the speaking in tongues that builds us up and encourages us and enables us to be able to do all that we can do. It's, it's possible. It's available to us. But the question is, for me, for all of us, I think, are we really Pentecostal in the sense that we go back to that point in time and we allow the Holy Spirit to work through us? We allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. I know we do every day. I know we pray. I know that we can't, by his grace, we can't do what we do unless we have him living in us and working through us. But do we really know the empowering of the Holy Spirit? Do we really know that in filling? That's the, the big question that I wanted to ask us today. Peter and the others, and Paul as well, but whether it be um, in, in Acts 2, where we've just read, whether it be again further on in Acts, where it's the, he, they, they go to Cornelius' house, if you remember the account there, they go to Cornelius' house. And um, Cornelius is, is a Roman soldier. Uh, the household is not a Jewish household, so really Peter and his companions shouldn't be there. They go along, they preach the gospel to, to the household. And as they preach the gospel, the household believes. And as the household believes, so the Holy Spirit comes upon them in power and they speak in tongues. And how do the others know that what's happened is the Holy Spirit? Because they speak in tongues. And that's what, that's what it says. I'm making a big thing of this. And you're going, Robin, why are you making a big thing of this? Well, because we don't and we should, because it is. People dance around it and say, no, we can, have, we can have a baptism in the Spirit because that's, you know, just a nice feeling or a warm glow inside. Or No, there's a physical, real evidence of the Holy Spirit. It was plain in Acts 2. It was plain in Acts 10. It was plain again in Acts 19 when Paul was, was there in Ephesus and there was a group of guys there who only knew the baptism of John, only knew repentance, didn't know anything about Jesus and didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. He preached to them, he shared with them, he showed them what was the reality. They were filled with the Holy Spirit once again and again it was evident. The evidence of speaking in tongues. These days we've, 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 we shy away from speaking in tongues because we think it's, you know, 
makes us look mad or makes us look crazy or makes, you know, we have churches that, that will not allow speaking in tongues these days. But that's something that is our inheritance. It's our heritage. It's right for us. Why? Well, for lots of different reasons. One, um, speaking in tongues, well, I could do a puzzle. I could do a quiz, couldn't I? What does speaking in tongues do for us? Two, two key things speaking in tongues does for us. Do, do folks understand me when I say speaking in tongues? Okay, well, let me explain that first, I suppose. When we receive the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we are baptised with the Holy Spirit, there is a release within us of a gift, and that gift from God is the gift of speaking in tongues, being able to speak a language that is a God language, and being able to speak something that is private, if you like, between me and God. It's something that just comes. Some of us may experience it, as, as we read in the Scriptures, by the laying on of hands. Some of us may experience it just simply by being in God's presence, and he comes upon us. There's different ways that that can happen. For me personally, um, I, I became a Christian in my sixth, uh, last year of a sixth form, um, then went away to Polytechnic, didn't understand any of these things, didn't know anything about any of this. I was put into, because I was late going to Polytechnic, I got terrible grades and uh, didn't get to, to my first choice of university. Um, so I ended up at Polytechnic, went to Poly and it was a good place to study, by the way, I'm not knocking it at all. Went there, so therefore didn't get into, into the, um, the, the student halls. Was put in digs, was put with a family, and that family happened to have a devout Catholic mom, Mrs. McAllister. And Mrs. McAllister would have her daily devotions every day, and she was the first person to teach me about speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues was something that was completely new to me and I didn't understand. And then over the next year or so, I explored that a bit more. What did that mean? And I sought this baptism in the Holy Spirit. I had a number of different encounters with the Holy Spirit. Do you know, we get that sense, don't we? Maybe you've experienced it where the Holy Spirit comes upon you and there's that real sense of peace. There's that sense he's present with us. He, there's that sense of awe and of wonder that God is at work in our lives. But the, I really got to the point, uh, because Mrs. McAllister suggested to me that, that we would receive the gift of speaking in tongues in her view, when we got to that point, though, we couldn't express ourselves fully to God in praise and in wonder. And I got to that point one particular day in my, my student bedroom, and I remember as I was sort of saying, God, I don't know what to say, so one word just came, and it was a word I didn't understand, and it's just one word, and I repeated it and repeated it. But that was, if you like, the spring. It was the, it was the floodgates starting to open. And from there, it grew and developed, and I experienced that ability to be able to speak in tongues. It's something that comes. It's something that, believe it or not, because we are part of the Assemblies of God, and we, if you go onto their website, there's a list of statements of faith, and it is one of our key statements of faith. I don't know if you knew that. It says this, We believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit as an endowment of the believer with power for service. That's what we've talked about up till now, and that's really, really good. I'm not knocking that at all. That's part of what we're about. But the ascent, it's with the essential biblical evidence of which is the speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives us utterance. Do you know, before 1906, there was hardly anybody in this country that spoke in tongues. There was a few. 1830, there was a bit of a revival happened up in Scotland, and there were some folks who did speak in tongues. But there were very, very few people who knew the baptism in the Spirit and be able to speak in tongues. It was discouraged, no less. And even after, well, anyway, we won't go into that. And then in 1906, what happened in 1906? Nobody was around, but nonetheless. Do you know, my, 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 um, my, my grandma um, was actually born in the 1800s, and so she remembered the earthquake in, in, uh, um, in California that happened in that 1906, it 1905, somewhere around there. And then soon after 1906 was the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles. The Azusa Street Revival, it was um, a, a pastor by the name of William Seymour who preached there, and he shared something that had been, he'd been encouraged and had learnt about uh, in, in a, a little Bible school he'd been part of in Texas. And he was shared about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, waiting on God to, to endue them with power, but also to be able to speak in tongues. And then from there, from that point, and that's where we trace our Pentecostal history too, if you like, as a church. Pentecost is where we started, back in Acts, but our Pentecostal history goes back to William Seymour and to the Azusa Street Revival. I don't know about you, I, I, I find it really nice to know that I've got 
a heritage that I can draw from. And there's a heritage in this place. I'm saying all this because I believe there's a heritage in this place and I want to get us to this. So it's a little bit of a history lesson and I know maybe for some of you it's like, oh, history. But no, come on. Listen because we are going to get somewhere. So next we have somebody called A.B. Barrett. And Barrett went over to, to, to the States, was experienced what went on there and came back, early 1900s, came back to Oslo and brought back this Holy Spirit movement. Now, bearing in mind, back then it wasn't flying across the Atlantic. It took weeks to get there and weeks to get back. Amazing, really, when you consider it. Then there's a chap called Alexander Body who was up in Sunderland. He was a, 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 an Anglican minister, and he went over to Oslo. He got this fire inside of him and this, this understanding of what, what it was to know the Holy Spirit in this way, to be baptized and to speak in tongues, and brought it back into this country. And, you know, you can still go to Sunderland now, and you can see some of the um, plaques and the like that celebrate uh, the, all that he did and all that he was part of. And at that point, the Pentecostal movement was birthed there. At that point, the early days of the Assemblies of God, of Elim, and of these other churches was, or denominations, if you like, was, was birthed there at that point. Very soon after, so we're, we're still in 1906, 1907, 1908, somewhere around then, very soon after, at that point, Smith Wigglesworth went along. Anybody heard of Smith Wigglesworth? Yeah. Smith Wigglesworth was someone who preached an evangelistic gospel and saw people healed, sicknesses, diseases. They say of Smith Wigglesworth meetings that he would hold a meeting and the ambulances would pull up outside to deliver the sick so that he could pray for them. Okay, the, the health service wasn't the same then as we have now, but nonetheless, wouldn't it be amazing if we were back into those sort of times? Smith Wigglesworth was one of those. And then from them, we had two brothers, the Jeffrey brothers, one of whom was Stephen Jeffries. I say all of this for a real reason, because these guys were people who preached the gospel, who saw sick sickness healed, who saw signs, wonders, and miracles, who saw people baptized and spoke in tongues. I say it because of the fact that's the heritage we have here. Why is it the heritage we have here? Well, this church was founded in 1976 as a Pentecostal church. Although originally the original building over there, 1829, was, put, was originally built there, St. John's Chapel, the first church in Burgess Hill, the first Christian place of meeting in Burgess Hill. Actually built by public subscription. It was the people who wanted it. Is that still true today? I wonder. The people who wanted the church built here. Um, but in 1976, from the IBTI, Jean-Jacques Spindon, John Wildrian planted this church with a group of students. And we still celebrate IBTI, and we're still connected with them, and that's wonderful. But that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the fact that Jean-Jacques was married to a lady by the name of Dorothy, and her, there are photographs of her as a little girl, young, maybe teenager, with Smith Wigglesworth. And Jean-Jacques, who spoke French and English and lived for many years in Switzerland, translated for Stephen Jeffries in his sessions and was there translating as he was praying for the sick. That's, that's a heritage we've got connected into here in this place. I really firmly believe in wells and of, of heritage and being able to see those come back up again. And I believe in this place we can see that heritage come back again. There's no reason why we can't be back in that place. I, I've got, I haven't got time to talk about Fred Squire. I haven't got time to talk about Donald G, who's spent his last days here, uh, and, and, you know, again, a, a phenomenal force within the Pentecostal movement. Look it up if you're interested. You're probably not, but I just really, really, I, I love these things. But the point I want to make, coming right back, because we need to come into line really quickly here, is firstly... <coughs> The Holy Spirit has been released to all of us, absolutely. Peter said what? He said, this is that. He said, folks, what you see is the fact that it was prophesied that the Holy Spirit will be released on all flesh. Everyone, all of us have got the opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit. If we believe in Jesus, if we've come to that relationship with him, if, if we've stepped over from darkness to light, then we've got the opportunity to be baptized in the Spirit. If we're baptized in the Spirit, we will know that he has baptized us. Why? Well, because we will be able to speak in tongues and be able to praise him in a language that only he and I know and to be uplifted and edified. If you've got time, do a search. Go through the scriptures. Have a look at Corinthians 14. Have a look at some of these other, 1 Corinthians 14 and some of these other places and understand what it is to be filled with the Spirit and to know that fullness. Each of us, according to Ephesians 3.19, has the capacity 
to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Uh, that, that, that to me blows my mind. The infinite God who made everything has, we've got the capacity to be filled with all of that. Wow, that blows my mind. You and I can know that fullness of God and an overflow to those around us. We can be a place whereby, like in, in Reading in California, we can see the community touched if we are willing ourselves to make that first step. Maybe you're already baptised with the Holy Spirit. That's wonderful. But the scripture says, doesn't it, in, in Ephesians 5.18, to go on being filled with the Spirit. Some translations just says, be filled with the Spirit. But actually, it's more like Mrs. Doyle and Father Ted, go on, 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 being filled with the Holy Spirit. We need him all of the time to be really filled time and time again by the Holy Spirit. If we're obedient to him and obedient to his leading, he will move through this place. He will move through this place. I, I, I long for it again, you know. There's times when I just say, oh, I can't be bothered. But these last few weeks have been really challenging. I'm sure just something personal. These last few weeks, I've had people near me who've passed away of my age, people who've been really important to either work, colleagues at work. Um, just this last week, we... Ruth and I attended the funeral of Mark Johnson. Some of you know that he was the assistant pastor back in the days of Graham Field. Younger than me, and I'm going, really? What are we seeing? Why fritter life away? Why, why shouldn't we see and know and experience the Holy Spirit moving amongst us in new, fresh ways? Thank you for listening to this week's message. For any more information or to find out more of what we do as a church, you can contact us at info at centrechurch.uk or check out our website at www.centrechurch.uk